Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first event of Viva Voce, which is a new series hosted by the Department of Italian Studies at NYU and Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimò. Um, my name is Eugenio Refini. I am a faculty member in the department um, and the organizer of this series of lectures and conversations, which will be revolving around voice, performance, and reception. Um, I initially conceived uh, Viva Voce as a series of events to be held live, dal vivo, in our beloved Casa Italiana. Uh, we can't do it, of course, uh, these days, but I'm truly delighted that while we wait uh, for the days when it will be possible to reconvene in person again, we can still launch this adventure remotely. An experience that does not come without perks, uh, for instance, the possibility to gather participants across several time zones. Um, I wish to thank the Department of Italian Studies for its support and, of course, Casa Italiana, uh, both its director, my dear colleague, Professor Stefano Albertini, who has enthusiastically supported this series, and the staff of Casa, without whom this online presence would not be possible. Many thanks in particular to Julian Zacks, who is holding all the technological pieces um, together. Um, given the topic of today's event, I'm also delighted to mention that we have NYU's Medieval and Renaissance Center on board. So let's get started. I could not be happier uh, to launch Viva Voce with the amazing panel of scholars that we have gathered today to discuss a relatively recent volume, uh, Performing Homer, The Voyage of Ulysses from Epic to Opera, which came out with Routledge in 2019. Edited by Wendy Heller and Eleonora Stoppino, this volume provides us with the ideal starting point for our conversations on voice, performance, and reception. Indeed, it includes a series of fascinating essays that, from a truly interdisciplinary and transhistorical vantage point, address the question of, and I quote from the editor's introduction, the performative potential of Homeric epic. Um, and I add that another aspect, of course, which is crucial to the book is uh, the series of many ways in which such performative potential of the Homeric epic has been played out across genres and historical periods. Now, in the interest of time, I won't say anything about the book at this point, um, swiftly moving instead to the panel discussion. Uh, and in the interest of time, I hope our guests won't mind if I keep the introductions short. Um, it is my privilege to introduce our discussants, um, whom I thank for accepting to join this event. Uh, they will be looking at performing Homer from two different and yet deeply interrelated perspectives, classics and comparative literature. Emily Pillinger is senior lecturer in Latin language and literature at King's College London, a specialist of Latin poetry and the reception of classics, particularly in music. She is the author of Cassandra and the Poetics of Prophecy in Greek and Latin literature. Sarah van der Laan is associate professor of comparative literature at Indiana University Bloomington, a specialist of epic poetry and its reception through the European Renaissance. She is the author of a forthcoming monograph entitled The Choice of Odysseus, Homeric Ethics in Renaissance Epic, which will be of great interest to many of us. To both Emily and Sarah, I owe some of the most stimulating conversations I've ever had on matters of music and reception. So I'm really happy that they are joining us uh, today. Um, today's icing on the cake is the presence of the two editors of Performing Homer, who will be responding uh, to Emily and Sarah's presentations. Uh, Wendy Heller is the Scheider Professor of Music History and Chair of the Department of Music at Princeton University, a leading scholar in the field of Baroque music. She is the author of one of the books that made me, and I suspect many others, veer towards the sirens of early opera, emblems of eloquence, 
opera and women's voices in 17th century Venice. And as many others, I can't wait for her current book project to be out, uh, animating Ovid, opera and the metamorphosis of antiquity in early modern Italy. Um, last but not least, we have Eleonora Stoppino, who's an associate professor of Italian at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, a specialist of medieval and early modern literatures uh, with concentrations on epic and romance, travel narratives, gender studies, animal studies. She is the author, among other things, of another of my favorites, uh, Genealogies of Fiction, Women Warriors and the Dynastic Imagination in the Orlando Furioso. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Emily for the first presentation. Then we will have Sarah, uh, the responses by Wendy and Eleonora, and we will then open it up to Q&As. Um, and we will be using the uh, Q&A function here um, on the Zoom webinar. Thank you all for being here. And thank you um, uh, for, uh, to the audience for being here as well. Um, thank you so much, Eugenio, um, for the introduction, but also for conceptualizing and planning such an amazing series and giving us this wonderful opportunity to share some ideas. Um, and thanks also to Julian's technical wizardry, um, but also to the editors of this book, to Wendy and Eleonora and all the contributors um, in producing such a resource to learn from and think with. Um, and I was just saying before we uh, started this whole um, workshop that really without any exaggeration, reading this book through cover to cover has been one of the academic highlights of a year that has felt grindingly hard, I think for me, but also for many of us. So um, many thanks for that. And I'm also really looking forward to hearing Sarah's thoughts on this as well. So what a joy. Um, I'd like to begin by giving you an idea of where I was coming from when I picked up this book. So I am a classicist and when I've worked in the field of classical reception, I've mostly focused on 20th century classical music, um, Britain, Birtwistle, Turnage, Xenakis. Um, and the composers that I have studied had often, have often seemed more concerned with processing a sense of rupture from the classical past um, than about obvious musical or human connections and continuities through time. Um, I find many 20th century composers return to classical myth apologetically um, or even reluctantly, um, and they filter the material through cynical and knowing lenses of psychoanalysis or postmodern surrealism or obscenity. And I've encountered a related issue on the classical scholarship front too. So I come from a field where people spend a lot of time piecing together fragments of manuscripts, of pots, of mosaics, to reconstruct a vanished world from the past. But we're particularly challenged when it comes to thinking about what counts as authentic reconstructions of sounds produced two to three millennia ago. So even those scholars who claim to be able to replicate elements of the music of ancient Greece and Rome, they cannot also replicate the contemporary responses of ancient audiences um, in a modern audience. So to most modern audiences, those few reconstructed sounds from the past are not a sufficiently immersive or familiar sound world for us to respond to them on an emotional level. So on both of those counts, I've spent a lot of time exploring tenuous connections between classical myth and its musical reception in the 20th century. Often, to be honest, without always being completely convinced that there is a real sonic thread that is linking the two. So in many ways, this book has actually really helped shift my thinking on this topic. And it's because the contributors from all of their different perspectives have tended to identify and explicate artistic forms that reinforce a sense of sonic continuity with the past rather than with uh, a rupture. And I wonder if this is perhaps partly because the volume emerged from a practical applied project um, from that production of Monteverdi's Il Ritorno d'Ulisse. So I wanted to just draw out two particular techniques in particular that I don't think I thought enough about until I read this book. 
and explain how I think they've helped me think through other works or performances that I have been working on and maybe struggling with. So the first thing I noticed is how often the contributors turned to discussing the diegetic musical elements in the Odyssey and in its sung receptions thousands of years later. So if I understand rightly, um, I'm not a musicologist, so apologies if I, if I do misunderstand, but diegetic music is music that emerges from within a narrative. So it is a sound that is produced from the original action, not the sound produced by later narrators or performers of that action. So as an example, we might think of a scene of a ball or a party in which musicians are providing entertainment. And this music, or perhaps dance, is part of the action, but it is also appreciated by the external audience of the scene. So the sound rises through the layers of performance and reception to create the impression of a direct communication between the sound world of the action and the sound world of contemporary performance. And as I read the book, I realized that in classics, I don't think this is a term we use in quite this way even though actually classicists have certainly identified that function of diegetic music in ancient art forms. So we see it at work in ancient Greek dramatic choruses, for example, where the performers may describe their own singing and dancing as not just a choral moment in a drama on stage, but a ritual act that is taking place within the action of the story. And a really good example of this is the chorus of the Furies in Aeschylus's Oresteia, whose singing and dancing is the means by which they ritually curse the matricidal Orestes. And they refer, they describe the, uh, what they call the malicious dancing of our feet. So right at the beginning of this volume, um, Debbie Steiner talks about the remarkable scene in Homer's Iliad, in which the Greek hero Achilles is sulking in his tent, away from the battlefield of Troy, nursing his resentment by playing the lyre and singing of what is described as the famous deeds of men. And most classicists find this a strange and atypical moment for an epic that is so much about conflict and so little about the consolations of art. But Steiner draws out many intriguing dimensions to the strangeness in this episode. For one thing, she makes the important point that epic in general um, is often conceived as being about war, but it's for performance away from war. And nonetheless, through his singing, Achilles is doing something strange. He's bringing these two worlds into uncomfortably close contact. He may have temporarily retired from the battlefield, but he's still right there in the world of conflict and the world of combat, and he's singing about it. Steiner also points out how the very instrument that Achilles plays, his lyre, was later identified by ancient literary critics with the very first lyre ever to exist, the lyre that was invented by the god Hermes and then handed over to Apollo before it's passed to the mortal Cadmus and then ultimately falls into the possession of Achilles. In other words, Achilles' lyre is a symbol of musical continuity, um, of the way in which musical performance is always there, um, cutting through the layers of myth and history. So Achilles singing and lyre playing thus breaches the line between epic martial action and the safe performance of its violence in different places at different times. And so this has helped me make sense of an episode that I've always found really hard to analyze. And that is that very same scene of Achilles singing as it appears in Michael Tippett's epic opera from the 1960s, King Priam. And the opera as a whole is stage managed by Hermes, the inventor of the lyre, and a narrator in the opera who occasionally breaks the fourth wall to draw the audience into specific moments in the opera. But by far the most intimate moment in the opera is the scene in which Achilles sings to his beloved Patroclus in his tent. And the brutal orchestration of the rest of the opera, which is all blasting woodwind and brass, which is also often diegetically linked to martial trumpeting, that is all briefly replaced by the simplicity of the tenor Achilles singing to the guitar, um, which is kind of a 20th century lyre. 
It is, in fact, a lyrical, emotionally charged song that is not about the deeds of epic heroes, but about Achilles' desire for his home, for his family, and possibly for Patroclus too. And so I now see how the diegetic dimension to this episode in the opera fits the broader themes of Achilles' song there. As Steiner said, the guitar lyre reaches back to recall Hermes' first compositions on the lyre. But it also, in this opera, looks forward to every moment in which a soldier strums a guitar whilst processing his or her personal feelings away from the institutions of war and away from the conventional epic commemoration of those institutions. And I think it's worth remembering that the first performance of King Priam took place at Coventry Cathedral Festival in 1962, a day after the first performance of Britain's War Requiem, as part of a programme that was designed to celebrate healing and reconciliation after the mass destruction of people and places in World War II. So that was one aspect that, that really kind of helped me in my own thinking. Um, Unlike the Iliad, Homer's Odyssey is not an epic about war, although it is arguably also an epic about a veteran's experience of PTSD after war. But there are many more opportunities for music to play a diegetic part in the action of the Odyssey. We've got banquets and bards and sirens. And plus, of course, there is that ultimate transformation of Achilles' lyre into Odysseus's bow an instrument that proves Odysseus's identity as he draws it, according to Homer, as easily as a musician tunes his lyre and plucks it so that it produces a voice like a swallow. And I found Michele Cabrini's explorations of these Odyssean diegetic moments in cantatas particularly fascinating, um, as he shows how the diegetic moments in these receptions of the Odyssey map onto the theme of journeying that is so central to Odysseus's story and challenge the audience to hear the layers of storytelling and allusivity at work. And once again, these scenes of musical performance create a connecting thread um, that is associated with the endurance of mythic stories, the continuity of human memory or imagination, and the links between one geographical place and another. So the second feature that I wanted to mention um, emerged particularly strongly from two chapters that push in a slightly different direction. Um, and this is Michela Baranello's chapter on the difficulty of reconstructing Baroque dance scenes and Andrew Eggert's chapter about the same problem when it comes to Baroque stage effects. And these challenges perhaps obviously resonate with a classicist similarly struggling to imagine a successful reconstruction of the sounds and effects of ancient music. So Eggert describes a different way of building a link between ancient text and modern performance, one that happens not by musically transcending the layers of reinterpretation and reperformance, but by acknowledging and foregrounding them. So Eggert gives the example of the director Jean-Pierre Ponel's 20th century ad um, adoption of visibly clunky 17th, 17th century stage technology, even on film, in a way that requires the audience to reach for the ancient Homeric narrative through the stagecraft of a 17th century theater goer, faced with elaborate but less technically expert stagecraft. So in other words, Ponel is deliberately erecting barriers for his 20th century audience, but these barriers are faithful in a different way to the ancient narrative and its continuity through time. His tricks may not encourage the audience to commune directly with the music of Homeric scenes, but they remind an audience of the many layers of historical interpretation and performance that have led up to and then fed into this latest production. And this approach has helped me rethink a very different production, which was an ENO production in 2019 of Gluck's um, Orpheus and Eurydice, directed by the choreographer Wayne McGregor. So one might expect that diegetic function to be at its most obvious in the story of a musician like Orpheus, but that wasn't the approach taken at all in this production. Um, so McGregor, 
radically shifted around the placement of musicians and dancers in his production. The stage was limited to the main singers and a troupe of ballet dancers. And there was a sort of frantic digital backdrop to this um, with these weird day glow costumes for the ballet dancers that were kind of triggered by certain moments um, that reflected that digital backdrop. Um, but meanwhile, the chorus was relegated to the pit along with most of the orchestra. And then a few instrumentalists were placed in the audience. And perhaps most interestingly, um, to these instrumentalists in the audience was added a sign language interpreter, which was a welcome touch, but that added not just accessibility, but also contributed to this general sense of a blurring of the lines between stage, pit and audience, between sound and visuals, um, and then also thematically between body and soul in a way that was also being played out on stage. So here, forcing the audience to confront the nuts and bolts of the performance and its various different choreographic, signed and sung dimensions was an immersive experience in its own way that did actually expose the many different creative Orpheuses that were involved in its production and indeed in every production of Gluck's opera. So really just to sum up, this volume did a brilliant job of reminding me of the ways in which while ancient sounds are largely lost, the actual concept of musical performance has remained constant over the millennia. And so from Hermes' lyre in Achilles' hands to Odysseus's bardic singing and bow stringing, and from there into every restaging of an ancient myth, the act and the repetition of performance itself remains the point of continuity that tr transcends every layer of reception. Thanks. Thank you, Emily. Uh, this was really um, a set of fascinating um, questions and issues, and I hope we will get a chance to um, get back to some of them. Uh, they all would deserve further discussion. Thanks very much for, for these. And uh, so at this point, I will just uh, move ahead, um, handing it over to Sarah. Thank you, Genial. Thank you so much for this invitation. It's such a pleasure to be invited to discuss a volume that I find so richly provocative, uh, edited by two scholars whose work I admire so much, drawing together familiar faces and faces remembered from meetings long ago. Uh, as a, a comparative uh, specialist and a specialist in uh, Renaissance opera and the classical reception of Homer across um, Renaissance epic and, and the operatic tradition. Um, my mastery is in a sense to be a jack of as many trades as possible. And so I'd like to offer some uh, reflections, three sets of reflections on the ways that the volume speaks to issues at the borders of interdisciplinary investigations in classical reception and Renaissance studies and interdisciplinary studies in literature and music. Uh, that I've been thinking about, that people I admire very much are thinking about, uh, and to think about some of the ways that the volume opens avenues for further inquiry. So I'd like to begin by making a claim for the importance of the volume that is even a little bolder than the editors make for it, but that I think is completely deserved. Uh, performing Homer richly demonstrates what I've long believed, which is that opera and epic belong on the same generic continuum. There's a subset of operas, let's call it heroic opera, that engages in the same conversation as epic, about heroism, about national or communal identity, as defined by a shared set of values that are incarnated by chosen heroes, by identification with a history or an experience that defines the past, the present, and the future of that community. We recognize this conversation very easily when we're talking about epic, most of all when we're talking about the Aeneid and the long line of epics that are heavily influenced by Virgilian poetics and cultural politics and that seek to define and unite a people from the Republican resistance of Lucan civil wars to the English nationalist imperialism of Spencer's Fairy Queen. And this is true of the Homeric poems too. Uh, Errol Malkin and Carol Doherty have written about how the Odyssey appears to locate and reinforce ideas of Greekness for a people who are emerging from a period of cultural recovery into an era of expansion, exploration, revitalized in new trading contacts, colonial activity. I'm firmly convinced that opera belongs to this epic lineage. Epic poetry gradually runs out of steam in the 17th century. It ceases to be a form and a forum for the serious exploration of public heroism, of civic virtue, of ideas of good government. The exploration of private virtue and personal heroism moves gradually into the emergent genre of the novel. 
but the parallel conversation about these issues in the public sphere and their communal and even national import moves on to the operatic stage. Um, I have argued that we should understand 17th century Venetian opera and its repeated explorations of the myth of Venice that Ellen Rosand has so richly uh, teased out for us as the Venetian equivalent of courtly dynastic epic, such as Ariosto's Orlando Furioso and Tasso's Jerusalem and Liberata. And I would also point to Suzanne Cusick's work on the political and dynastic implications of Francesca Tvacini's La Liberazione di Ruggero. Cusick makes it amply clear that the Medici court under the dual regency of Christina of Lorraine and Maria Magdalena of Austria uh, turned to Caccini's proto-operatic work to make the same points about the nature and the values of the Florentine state and the political legitimacy of its rulers that we're used to finding in Renaissance dynastic epic. Um, we could look further forward uh, and point out that in Nabucco, Verdi uses Old Testament narratives of Jewish identity and history to stand in for Italian identity and nationhood, uh, very much as Ruth Smith has shown that more than 100 years earlier, Handel was doing for the English. Uh, that Handel's operas and oratorios provided 18th century Londoners with tales of classical heroism and Old Testament virtue in which to see themselves and their national aspirations reflected. And it's worth pointing out that they did so at a moment, again, when the state of English epic uh, was pretty moribund. It could be summed up in the double identity of Alexander Pope as being at once translator of Homer and author not of epics, but mock epics, such as The Rape of the Lock and the Denciad. Pope was the greatest English poet of his age. He was obviously deeply interested in classical epic, but he never completed more than a few lines of his projected Brutus. It was left to handle, building on the work of his librettists, to raise those questions of epic for an English audience. What experiences and values define our community, our nation? What are our unique excellences, our arts? Who are our heroes? And so I'm aware that in making this claim for opera as a successor to epic, I might seem to be contradicting uh, the excellent essays of Robert Kedrer and Hendrik Schultz. Uh, in fact, on the contrary, I find both to be enormously provocative in the most constructive sense of that word. Uh, Schultz draws on Emil Steger for a vision of epic as a fundamentally static, deictic, didactic genre, um, which does not trade in uh, the character development or the narrative suspense that in Steger's poetics are reserved for drama. Now, pretty obviously, I don't agree with these poetics, which are grounded in German Romanticism, uh, rather than Renaissance genre theory or contemporary studies of classical or Renaissance epic. Um, and so I don't really share uh, Schultz's classification of operas, but I find his discussions of the uses of allegory and exemplarity in both prefaces and libretti to have enormous potential uh, to kind of illuminate for us, not only what audiences found helpful or not helpful in exploring these big questions, um, but even more importantly, to help us understand what went wrong with epic itself around the turn of the 17th century. Um, poets writing for an audience increasingly used to consuming epics framed by copious allegorizing and moralizing paratexts began to feel it necessary to compose not just allegories of their epics after the fact, as Tasso did with the Liberata, um, but allegorical epics themselves. And I think this is some of where epic begins to lose its steam. Um, and that thinking about Schultz's work and thinking about the uh, libretti and the prefaces that he draws our attention to can help us to unpack what's going wrong in literature itself, uh, as well as in some dead ends on the operatic stage. Failure is also the subject of Ketterer's essay, uh, which provides a persuasive analysis of the reasons for the failure of Capecci and Scarlatti's opera Telemical. Um, and that subject certainly has epic antecedents. Um, but again, since I see epic as fundamentally a set of questions rather than a set of intermediate poetics, uh, Ketterer's analysis doesn't seem to me to argue against this idea of an opic, uh, operatic epic continuum. On the contrary, I think uh, his thoughtful discussion of the many different needs and expectations that an audience brought to the opera house shows us how to begin asking what needs and expectations that audience might once have brought to epic uh, and, and been frustrated by uh, in the epics that they were encountering um, and how those needs and expectations might instead have been met by opera. Not all opera, um, but some. And I'm very much looking forward to exploring these ideas further in some of the Odyssey operas that he lists in his appendix. So let me turn now to my second set of reflections. 
uh, the introduction sketches and Eleonora Stopino's essay beautifully demonstrates a set of methodological concerns and approaches that have been emerging in uh, classical reception studies over the past few years, and that I'm very much hoping to see further discussed and theorized that I hope performing Homer will spur us to develop further. Until very recently, studies Classical illusion and later works paid relatively little attention to the horizon of expectations, to borrow Yaus's term, that governed readings of those classics at the time the illusions were being created. Scholars often assumed that their readings of Homer and other poets were universal and projected them backward onto the poets they were studying with no concern for possible anachronism, or perhaps by cherry picking uh, one bit of evidence and taking it out of context. Um, and I think that performing Homer is both a valuable sign and an agent of this increasing interest in historicizing intertextuality. Uh, so let me try to explain a little bit more what I mean by that. In my own work, I try to marry two kinds of reception. The first might be called classical reception, but really I mean something more akin to the history of reading. How is a text, say the Odyssey, read at a given point in time, say perhaps 1500 to 1532? How was it interpreted? What ideas or values or perspectives did it or its characters become shorthand for? How was it used to think with? What was it read for? By whom? And obviously each of these questions throws up a plurality of answers. So essentially what I try to do is to sketch out some stretches of the horizon of expectations for a classical work at the time that a Renaissance work uh, was being created in dialogue with it. The second kind of reception that I'm interested in used to go under the name of creative reception. That term isn't much used anymore. Uh, we tend to use words like illusion and intertextuality instead. Um, this is simply studying the ways in which one work, say the Orlando Furioso, draws upon another work, say the Odyssey, uh, for structure, narrative, characters, similes, uh, concerns, poetics, all the things that go into making the meaning of a text. So the Furioso becomes both a creative work and a piece of Homeric reception. And a study of this aspect of the Furioso becomes both a study of Ariosto and a study in Homeric reception at that time. Now, the reason that creative reception remains valuable to me is that it pays more attention to authors, composers, painters, performers as mediating figures between the original text and the new work, not as arbiters who fix and determine meaning for all time, uh, but as agents who create some points of entry for one work into another, and who begin some conversations between those works that the reader or audience is then invited to follow and join. Um, we might borrow the classicist Alessandro Barchiese's wonderfully productive term uh, and talk about creative reception as exploring le tracce del modello. Uh, and Stephen Hines has translated tracce in this case as trace track trail. Uh, and this tripartite translation captures the flexibility and the indeterminacy that Barchiese wants to tease out of one work's presence in another, and the partial and very incomplete nature of the author's agency over those tracce. So the author leaves traces of his own reading of a model work for his reader to analyze. In following that model, he lays down tracks for his reader to follow in reading his work with another work in view. But he also creates the possibility that the reader could blaze his own trail through the intertextual wood he creates, following the traces of the original work in ways the author did not anticipate. And I try to make maximum allowance for this last possibility and to recover traces of such alternative readings whenever possible. But it seems to me counterproductive to deny that at least some of the time when text is present in another because an author put it there. And trying to understand how that source text was available to be interpreted by author and readers, what its horizon of expectations was, can help us to deepen our understanding of how those presences of one text in another work to create its meaning. And Nora's essay on Ariosto's Ulysses is a lovely demonstration of the possibilities of these methods of reading. It's not an old fashioned positivist source study. She's asking much more sophisticated questions than that. What assumptions and preconceptions about Odysseus and Penelope did Ariosto's readers bring to their reading of the Orlando Furioso? How did Ariosto draw upon and respond to and engage with and make use of those preconceptions in his work? And she answers them in beautifully supple and subtle fashions by setting the Furioso's uses of Odysseus and Penelope alongside their uses and their presence in the enormously popular tradition of the Roman de Troyes. 
And she shows us how that popular tradition illuminates both Ariosto's dialogue with Homer and the conclusions Ariosto's readers might have drawn from that dialogue. And finally, let me offer a third set of reflections uh, on the volume's invaluable paving of a two-way street between poetry and genres that are not or not solely textual. Too often, literary critics, present company, obviously accepted, uh, assume that adaptation and influence flow in one direction only, from literature to other media. And so, you know, putting ourselves at the center of the world, we tend to assume that criticism therefore flows in the same channels, that literary scholarship can help us to think about other genres. But we don't do enough to educate ourselves in scholarship beyond literary criticism, to ask how musicological scholarship and performance theory could help us to think more capaciously about non-dramatic works of literature. And we don't do enough to think about how literature might be shaped by or respond to works in other media. Um, Jorns Harn's essay is a wonderful demonstration of my first point, that scholarship beyond literary criticism can help us to become better literary critics. Harn draws on Gary Tomlinson's theory of metaphysical song to investigate what in recent years have frankly threatened to become a stale cliche that Homer allied to the roles of Odysseus and the poet. Um, but guided by Tomlinson, Harn draws our attention to the ways that imagery and simile ask us to blur and distinguish the subjectivities of Odysseus, poet, Apollo, god of poetry, the performer who sings the Odyssey itself. And this is a wonderfully new and rich way that we can think about uh, this old question and bring new energy and new ideas um, to discussing it and draw new insights from it. Performing Homer amply demonstrates how performances and performance theory help us to think about the Odyssey itself. Emily has mentioned Deborah Steiner's elegant study. And it also shows us how performances and adaptations can shed light again on intermediate points in its reception. So Joanne Cavallo's essay on the epic macho tradition discusses the of Homer's complex characters to exemplars of single virtues. And I suspect that this trend to exemplarity might help us to think about the simplifications and fragmentations of Homeric characters and classical personages generally in Renaissance popularizations. The endless encyclopedias and dictionaries and printed commonplace books and compendia of all kinds churned out by humanists to help pupils through their compositions and busy graduates remember, or at least fake remembering, their studies. Um, this is a fragmentation that's widely criticized. It's criticized by Melanchthon. It's criticized and mocked and caricatured by Ariosto uh, in his repeated rewritings of an Odyssean situation that has to be navigated by a character who boasts only one Odyssean trait, a Norandino trying to escape the very Polyphemus-like orc with nothing but uxoriousness to guide him, for example. And I suspect that further studies of the ways in which the Magi based on the Odyssey distill such characters as Odysseus and Penelope could help us to better understand uh, these similar distillations in the Renaissance context from which the Magi emerged. And so to better understand both how the Odyssey was read and used and how poets responded to these needs and interests when they embedded Odyssey and Drache in their works. Uh, to illustrate my second point, that we should think about literary works as adaptations of works in other media, I come at last to Ellen Roseanne's essay. I've saved her for last because I've been intellectually and personally formed by Ellen's teaching and scholarship in ways that I couldn't begin to unpack. She's been a beloved teacher and mentor since I was a college sophomore, and it was she who suggested in a graduate seminar on Monteverdi's Venetian operas more years ago than I care to admit uh, that I might look into the Renaissance reception of the Odyssey. Uh, and Ellen introduced me to a perfect example of a literary work informed by opera, uh, which she mentions in her essay for this volume and she discusses in Monteverdi's Venetian operas. Uh, this is an unfinished prose novella, La Perpezia d'Ulisse, ovvero la casta Penelope, by the young incognito Federico Malipiero. Malipiero claims that his novelization of the Odyssey was inspired by Monteverdi's Ritorno d'Ulisse. And I think I see him borrowing and extending strategies that Monteverdi develops to push back against uh, the librettist Barbaro's adoption of misogynist tropes from the Castellano delle Donne in his libretto. Edith Hall traces an even more complex intermedial lineage from Victorian classical burlesque through classical scholarship or pseudo scholarship to novel and finally opera. And I wonder how many more literary works that are inspired by or responding to music must be out there just waiting for scholars to draw them together and to begin to theorize this neglected avenue of adaptation and cultural exchange. Um, I expect that Wendy Heller is about to enlighten us on this topic. And I wonder how many more collaborations of literary scholars and musicologists and other interdisciplinary pairings are just waiting to be forged. 
Uh, so thank you, Wendy and Ellen, for laying down, down a set of trache for us to follow. And thank you, Eugenio, for bringing us together today to discuss the next steps forward. Thank you, Sarah. This is another great set of, uh, you know, clusters really of, of problems and questions. And again, we should probably, you know, devote uh, a bunch of seminars to all the points which came through your, your presentation. Thanks so much. And also for the idea of future collaborations, which is certainly something which we need to look into, right? Especially thinking ahead of when we will get back to some sort of more sociable routine. Um, okay, uh, I would at this point hand it over to um, Wendy and Nora, who will be responding to these stimuli, which we just received from Emily and, and Sarah, and uh, we will move with the conversation from there. Thank you so much. I mean, this is, I, I, I feel sort of on the verge of tears here, I have to say, um, because this, this volume, um, we, we, we joked for many years that it took us not quite as long to do this volume as it took Ulysses to get home, but almost as much. I mean, I think, you know, Nora had to gather her family in those years. I became chair of a department and, you know, life went on. And somehow, you know, Ulysses, the, 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 the boat kept getting, you know, derailed. But I think in many ways it was fortuitous because I think it came together at a particular moment where we were able to, for instance, Joanne Cavallo's brilliant essay. We didn't have that originally and we did later on and it's so perfect. So sometimes, you know, as with the, as with um, uh, Ulysses journeys, things happen in the time that they happen in. But, um, you, you know, the, the collaboration that Nora and I started, we sort of began talking about a lot of this when we were together at, at Itati even more years ago. And the instinct that somehow there's more to be said about this intersection between performance and literature than we had imagined that what that was being said. And many of the things that seemed obvious to us were not being talked about. And so in some ways, this volume allowed that to play out. So uh, your comments, um, Emily and Sarah, are so wonderful. I'll, I'll try to pick up on a few points. Right now, I just want to point out that right behind me there, um, is um, this is Homer in the center, and um, this is the, um, the the mosaics from Richardson Auditorium, the Holzer mosaics that we decide discussed briefly in the introduction to our book. That was the the backdrop for um, our performance, and it just seemed like a very natural thing to throw a bunch of undergraduates on you know undergraduate non music majors on the stage doing a performance of the Return of Ulysses with Homer sort of beaming down on us. So I thought that this was a, a sort of um, fitting thing. So in this particular drawing, the central mosaic has Homer in the center, and he's flanked on one on the one side by Helen, Paris, and Mentor, and on the other side by Odysseus, Penelope, and Telemachus. And um, as I mentioned in the volume, one wonders exactly what message this was intended to give to young men studying at Princeton at the end of the 19th and early 20th century, what it was that they were to aspire to. But I think that tells us something about how these messages are conveyed and the kind of eternal um, in eternal ways in which these meanings change. Um, but to get more specifically to some of the points that, that, that both of you brought out that was so wonderful, a few think, things I'd like to comment about, um, um, and then I'll say a couple words about the performance. One is I think this notion, Emily, that you brought up about, about continuity versus this rupture and the, the difference in some ways between this 20th century reception of the classics and this moment in the 16th and 17th century. And I think that's a really interesting point because I think that that there's 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 rupture in both instances, but I think the rupture is a really in is a really different one. And if there's an apologetic um, and even psychoanalytic and all those things that you talked about. I was wishing I'd listened to, it's been a long time since I've listened to Tippett's King Prime, which I think is a really amazing piece, but really, really kind of daunting piece in many ways. Um, thinking about how 
if there's an apologetic and maybe sometimes artificial notion in the 20th century, I wonder if in the 17th century, it isn't a kind of, you know, enormously playful as if, you know, these librettists and poets, you know, they've got the, the, the Renaissance epics, which Nora will say more about, and they've got these toys that they can play with. And in some ways it's like, well, let's see what I can do. I, I was looking um, in terms of another paper um, thinking ahead to the RSA coming up, gosh, you know, coming up very soon. I was looking at a, a, the, the Armida libretto that Ferrari wrote that I'm doing a paper on in a few weeks. And there's a comment that Giulio Strozzi makes about that libretto a year later. He says, what's great about this libretto is it has nothing to do with, it has no words or anything from Tasso. So he's bragging, right? He's bragging about the fact that we're presenting an opera about Armida that has absolutely nothing to do with Tasso. And in fact, it doesn't because, well, it has something, it has Armida, but, you know, Pluto sends furies and Cupid comes down and it's it's kind of crazy. But that kind of, what are the materials that we can play with? Now, um, of course, Ritorno is a more serious piece, um, and it, it's, but there is a playfulness within it. And I think even thinking about um, what um, what uh, um, Michaela talks about, M Michaela Maranello talks about in terms of how those madrigals played out in that performative moment is part of that playfulness. So there's continuity, but the continuity is one that um, that that has that rupture that in some ways I think is based on playfulness. I think the the other point that I would make thinking about the the diegetic elements and maybe where we could think about the, what what is that continuity if we find it is that I think in many ways all of these pieces, um, whether it's music or the the music or the music the literature responding to the music that Sarah talked about so 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 um, eloquently and um, what how that two-way street works is that there is a sense that there's the soundscape of the epic so even if we sort of even let go of the idea that there's th this diegetic or non-diegetic distinction which is useful useful in opera whether somebody's singing a lullaby or just you know singing there's a sense that there's a soundscape to the Odyssey, for instance, there's a soundscape to the Iliad. There's a soundscape. You know, I think Ariosto is somehow noisier than Tasso, right? If we're to sort of think about what the noisiness is, right? And and that, in some ways, what we're doing is listening to the soundscape within the, that the epic makes, and then the sounds that are even inside of that. Um, and I've tried to think of a more elegant way to say that, but I'm not quite there. And I think that's part of what all of these di different pieces accomplish in different ways um, with genre inflecting it in a different way. So, for instance, um, um, Michele Cabrini's work on the cantata, that operates really differently because it's happening within the mind, more like what a reader does, whereas opera takes everything and externalizes it right in this rather different way. And I think that's part of that, that journey, if you will, of what, how epic plays itself out and how we might think about some of the, um, some of the diegetic elements. Um, but I think that's part of this journey, right? How can we, how can we, uh, how can we listen to the pieces we read, and how can we read the pieces we listen to? And maybe that's the kind of sort of sort of thing that 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 we that we're, we're interested in. Um, that may be. I think that may be the moment for me to stop and turn turn this over to to Nora and, you know, we can always come back and discuss some other things, but it's always good to put a period on the end of a sentence. So here we go. So I'll, I'll take it from there. Um, thank you, Eugenio, for organizing. Um, thank you to the department and to Julian. And thank you to Emily and Sarah. I share Wendy's um, state. Um, it, it is um, really, um, quite wonderful to um, 
to listen to your voices if I can continue <laughs> with the with the puns. Um, I have learned a lot um, working with Wendy on this uh, volume, and I'm learning even more today um, by by listening to you. I'm going to um, focus on a, on a few things uh, myself. Um, when Wendy and I started talking about this, and and then the conference um, at Princeton took shape with the performance and then um, the volume uh, took shape. We had um, very clear in mind that we were talking about different genres, but we were talking about our genres, um, as Sarah says, um, as performance in a continuum with uh, um, waves from one genre to the other and, and vice versa. And um, this has uh, guided us in, in because we share the conviction that um, epic and opera are inherently performative um, genres. And um, I was particularly struck by uh, what Sarah was saying um, about the personal and the public, because I've always thought, well, I was taught at a certain point, I don't remember exactly when, that epic is a genre of the collective. It is where the community forges itself and um, makes itself um, around the hero. I have always resisted. Um, such definition of epic. And part of the reason why um, I think um, it is good to resist it is that epic lives in performance. And the um, bits and pieces of it that um, are re-sung, remembered, rewritten, are constantly manipulated um, and um, there is no such a thing as um, for the reception of it, um, of one monolithic um, omer, uh, as there is no such a thing as um, even one monolithic ariosto, which is its own different kind of um, ironic and community um, confusing um, epic. So um, this inherent... Um, performative quality um, has looking at epic in the light of opera has um, taught me that um, it is very helpful um, to look at the circulation circulation of epic in um, for instance in, in Renaissance Italy as a performance. Um, if we take the case of um, Renaissance Ferrara, we know that um, singers, or Renaissance Florence for that matter, of course, um, um, Cantimpanca, Canta Storie, were reciting versions of uh, um, uh, chivalric poems, um, epic poems, even classical poems that were um, patchworked and assembled and reassembled um, in their performances. Um, and a, a lot of very interesting work is being done um, right now on the um, importance of this um, performative aspect um, of epic. And the distinction private public in that um, really comes into question. Um, in the um, uh, moment of a performance, um, you know, in, in Ferrara, uh, we have written records of the fact that, oh, those epics, including Ariosto, even children and Don Niccioli constantly listen to them. And what is more um, inclusive? than um, uh, an opera um, production. So for me, um, uh, one really important element of this um, common performativity of the genres um, bridges into how we see um, gender in these um, in these um, performances in that of course you know I have had the privilege of um, working with Wendy and um, 
having her inspire me with um, the way in which these singers took what they were given and um, made them into um, sometimes a, a, a you know a, a claim and in that sense um, this has been quite helpful in in looking at our, our volume in thinking about um, as Sarah says issues of reception what in certain texts um, what in Ariosto and Tasto becomes uh, that specific aria um, that really pushes the agency um, of the singer who takes it on. Um, uh, what is there, I um, completely agree uh, with you, Sarah, in, in that, um, what is there perhaps wasn't there, but the fact that someone saw it uh, and and took it um, and and made it into that claim. I think is something that um, uh, is extremely important to to think about. And uh, the final um, uh, point I wanted to um, think about um, is this question of um, characters as a as a. As a scholar of epic, I am obsessed by characters, by the fact that uh, in the, these serial epics I, I work with, you have um, Orlando, who can be um, the brave hero, then modified into a fool, then into something else again. And um, what is particularly important for me to find out is what is um, that unifying principle that keeps our um, attention consistent and keeps us thinking that we do in fact know who Orlando is, even though he's been completely misshapen um, through the centuries. Um, and, you know, working on this essay and looking at the um, operatic versions of these characters has really made me think about the role of performers in, uh, in, in, in this. Um, the fact that they're, that individual performers take on a role in a way that is not dissimilar from what happens in the serial texts that all have an Orlando and all have a Rinaldo, but modify it um, for specific reasons. So, um, and, and in that sense, um, I find it particularly uh, fitting that the image behind Wendy has Homer as the character right, among his characters. In this continuity um, of performance and reception that constantly um, shapes itself. And with that, I will probably stop here, but thank you again for wonderful readings. Thank you, Nora and Wendy, um, for your responses. Um, in the interest of time, and since I would like also to give an opportunity to our um, uh, audience members, uh, whom I thank for being here um, to um, ask um, questions, please, if you, uh, and I'm talking to the uh, audience members at this point, uh, feel free to drop questions on the Q&A function. That's the um, easiest um, way for us to deal with questions. Um, um, I just wanted to maybe give Wendy a chance to show the pictures which you were talking about from the uh, production of Il Ritorno, which sort of um, originated the project of the book. Sure. Um, thank you. Let me just um, share the, make sure I'm sharing the proper screen so that you don't all have to read my email, which would be really, really unfortunate. Um, I'll just say, say, uh, here we go. Here we go. Um, just say a few words. Um, you can see, yes, you can see, yes. I'm just going to move that so I can see what I'm showing you. Um, we did this production. This is probably the fifth or sixth, I mean, fourth or fifth production of a Baroque uh, Venetian opera that we've done at Princeton. We've done two, two um, 
two Popeyas, one Ulisse, uh, two, now two Callistos, Due Callisti, non so, and a um, um, couple of other things. But th this is where I wanted to just show you our set that this was where the mosaics are. And we don't need to build this. We don't have an opera theater, but you don't need to build a set for Ritorno di Ulisse when you have... Um, you have Homer looking over it. Um, so just a few, these are just a few shots, but I, um, this is the production that Andrew Egger design um, worked on with us. Um, and it was set in a kind of, um, he did it as a kind of um, post-World War I kind of flap or era piece that sort of captured that sense of, um, you know, the post-war moment. And so just a few scenes, this is our Milanto and, um, um, and and um, Penelope, um, Ulisse, who is um, early on, early on in the opera, just when he's going to do the old man thing. Um, our goddesses were elevated, as you can see here. Um, here is Ulisse at the moment where he draws the bow, which I think is really quite splendid. And we did a lot of that with, um, and, and these are undergraduates. So, um, um, this was a physics major, right? You have to remember that our Lisa was a physics major, just a wonderful thing. And finally, the final reunion between um, between um, Ulisse and um, Penelope. And I just wanted to show that, just have a sense of, of there's a moment where the epic becomes opera through Moda Verdi, and then it becomes this stuff that's coming out of the mouths of our students, right? That they are embodying in a certain way. And, and watching that happen and sort of seeing that as part of a, an, and it's part of the education too. So it's, yes, it's students putting on an opera and it's an opera, but it's, it's this notion that somehow Homer is still part of this educational process, right? So, you know, maybe not exactly what they imagined when they put those mosaics up and they never imagined that there would be a, a woman on that stage singing, for example, you know, in, in the old, the old image of Princeton. But yet it's it's part of that educational thing and the knowing that happens for the students when they get to be these characters, I think reminds me of what Nora was saying. Who, who is Ulysses? Who are the characters? How are they? And what happens when as a singer you embody them, I think ends up being a really interesting thing. So um I will I will end there, but but it's nice to sort of think back on that moment because performance did help us think through, I think, where where we wanted this work to go. Thank you, Wendy, for pointing out this particular point, which is actually extremely interesting. And of course, it's of relevance to the many uh, issues which have been raised um, in the in the presentations by Emily um, and Sarah. I think one of the issues which seems to be extremely important to all of you, all of us, I would say, is this sort of, um, Sarah put it in terms of a generic continuum, right, which is including both rapture and, um, and continuity, to get back to Emily's uh, uh, point. And uh, the idea that in a way the space of performance is the space where these genres uh, with all the possible forms of hybridization um, gets to be constructed in the first place, right? In a way, uh, epic uh, at least um, originally begins as a performative genre, and the same of course can be said about, about opera. And even if the functions, even in social terms, um, ideological terms of these two genres are certainly different, they seem to find this thread, which is exactly the performative dimension, dimension of both, which I think, if I'm if I'm correct in interpreting the various threads which you have been gathering both in the presentations and the, in, in, in the responses is really also a productive way of rethinking through questions about reception, classical reception, but reception more, more broadly. And the role played um, about, you know, the role played by bodies in this, in this sort of narrative, right? These texts, um, both epic and opera come to life through bodies, through real voices, um, either those of the first performers or those of the students or even professional singers these days who happen to be reenacting these 
texts. Um, and that's why the multifaceted perspective of the book, which includes things as different as the Maggi, Epici, and you know, more regular operatic productions is so fascinating and, uh, and compelling. Um, so thank you all for bringing these um, uh, threads together. So there is a question um, on the um, Q&A function. Um, can you provide some examples of contemporary operas which best express the points you are making? And by you, I guess, we, we all. Um, so how does this conversation might fit a discussion about contemporary, contemporary opera? Um, that's a good question. Yeah, that's really challenging. I don't know that uh, I try to take a stab at it. And, and Emily, maybe you can jump in, but let me think. I mean, I think that that in some ways these questions um, and apply to to almost any operatic repertory because what what you sort of think that you have if you're going to take epic, some kind of epic that has something that has this, this kind of breath, right? And this kind of all the things we've talked about, epic, the community and breath and, and these multi-layered kinds of things that when you translate it into music, there are certain kinds of things that happen. You know, a decision is made, somebody has to decide who gets to sing, a lot, who gets to sing a little. They have to decide which moments are going to be set, um, how it's going to be, you know, how it's gonna be, what the disposition is, if you will, right? So there's always gonna be that moment. And then it's simply, what's the musical language? You know, so at the beginning of the 17th century, there's this moment where you've got all this, this kind of soloistic musical language available to you. So you could, there were certain things that you could do in 1630, 40, that you couldn't do in 1540, because we just, that wasn't where the language is. And now we have different strategies, right? So, so we think about, um, you know, whether it's, um, if you're doing an opera now, on a, a, if you were doing writing a Ulysses opera, how would you construct that libretto that maybe reflected contemporary concerns, right? That got at what this moment is about in the same way that Baduaro sort of gets at what 17th century Venice is about. How do you use the technology available to you? Is it film, right? Is it is it is it um, computer graphics, right? You know, what suppose you take Game of Thrones. There's an epic, right? And you decide you wanted to turn it into an opera. What would you do? So I think it really is about what's available to you in the, in the genre that you're working in, be it opera or anything else, what technologies are available, and then how that disposes itself in a way. That, that, that's very general with not a single specific example. Thank you, Wendy. Yes, I mean, I think you got a very good and compelling point here. Um, um, Emily, you were about to say something. Yeah, I'd love to, yeah. thank you. I think sure. this is um, an interesting question. I deliberately tried not to talk about my most recent obsession um, because I'd just written an article on Xenakis and his um, settings of the Oresteia, which might have been why the Furies were in my head as well when writing this. Um, it's not contemporary, but he, the last part of it that he wrote was in the 1990s, so it's it's quite recent. Um, and I, I, the reason I, I just wanted to mention it is because it brings up a couple of things that I've been thinking about that have to do with this generic crossing and embodiment, and lots of these issues, um, is that first of all, it's a setting of a tragedy, and I feel like Tragedy is perhaps a genre that we haven't talked about, but that is very much about thinking about how is the personal related to the communal? You know, how do small monarchical families get into a situation where their decisions have huge consequences for the communities that they rely on? So I feel like when we're thinking about this generic mixing, that is that is there in the background as well with the Baroque operas, but, um, but also happening in the 20th century. What I think is so interesting about that particular, um, the piece that I've been working on of Xenakis is um, a small vocal piece that he wrote in the 80s actually to be part of his Oresteia project. 
And here we've got so much going on in the Oris Dyer project. We've got choruses of children that he uses. He kind of mixes up who, who are going to tell this story. Um, he uses electronic tracks. So there's a lot of kind of, he was really interested in electronic music. He's trained as an architect. So he's using concepts of space. He does these enormous, spectacular productions called polytopes, where he kind of puts on sonne lumière in particular places in Persepolis, in Athens. And he was also an exile from Greece um, as a kind of, as a leftist and a member of the resistance in the Second World War. So he's thinking a lot about displacement too. And the work that I've been looking at is an insert that is written for a male singer to sing an episode from the Oristia to a liar. So it does pick up a little bit on this idea of, of this particular intimate instrumentation. Um, and he uses a psaltery rather than an ancient liar, but he's obviously trying to, um, a psaltery from Java, but he's trying to think a little bit about ancient um, instruments and instrumentation and how to create that sense of continuity. What's so fascinating is that this male singer sings the role of the prophet Cassandra in falsetto and sings the role of the chorus in his chest voice. And he basically has to sing this exchange in one single body. And it is frantic. It is absolutely extraordinary as a production. And I just think it brings up a lot of these questions of that moment of performance. It is almost unperformable. And it was created in collaboration with a Greek singer, Spiros Sakas, that he'd worked with quite a lot, um, who was spectacularly good at this kind of performance but in some it's almost un, it's certainly unperformable in the same way the notation is a little bit like epic it's kind of impressionistic it's not it's quite improvisational so I think there are lots of ways in which that particular work in the 20th century if not the 21st century picks up on some of these questions of performativity the involvement of the body um, particular soundscapes that are rooted in particular geographical places um, there's, there's a lot going in there. So I, I, I think that's a really rich um, work to think with on these sort of topics. Um, thank you, Emily. That is great. Um, I'm seeing that we have another question on the chat, but I also received a message from Albert Ascoli, who would like to ask um, a question. So I will try to uh, play technology here and I will try to let him in. So um, let's see if this works out. Um, please bear with us while we try to get this um, work. Let's see. I see that Albert is connecting. There, there you are. Here I am. Great uh, to see you. <laughs> it's good to see you, Eugenio. Thank you so much for this uh, uh, this set of performances. And um, I, as a disclaimer, I have to say that I, though I own the book, I have only dipped into it, and I am now uh, fully prepped for um, uh, for a complete read through. I have a I have a number of of sort of comments slash questions, um, and I'll start with one of them. And if I you want to move on, just let me know. The, the first question, has, the first issue has to do with the um, public versus private and the, and the association or not of uh, Epic with um, uh, on the public side. And on that question, I really, I, I think that the issue of studying the Odyssey um, is, already a complication of that of that idea um, of the of the idea of, of epic as uh, as public um, it's it clearly contrasts to a significant degree with the um, uh, uh, with the Iliad and one can argue that it's that it's as much a, a sort of personalization or at least, a, uh, uh, the poss gives us the possibility of of a kind of simple step from the personal from the public to the personal through the figure of this of this one individual. There are other questions about the <clears throat> you know the interaction uh, in both texts between a kind of conflict of cultures, uh, and that's especially noticeable in the again in the Odyssey uh, where 
there's as much a kind of breakdown of the idea of a, of a coherent culture as there is. Um, so that's one question I have about sort of what it is about the Odyssey story that, um, that in a kind of way lends itself to um, a movement into a, a, an individual focused. Uh, uh, the other questions have to do in, in a sense with this question of, that, that Eugenia raised only, but kind of briefly about the, the fact that the Homeric texts have been seen as uh, to a large extent as uh, in recent times as performances that have kind of fossilized into a text. Um, that, that is that uh, rather than there being a Homer, there were uh, there was a tradition that kind of evolved as the text was being performed and then ended up being written down. And that uh, in a sense leads me to another set of questions about the way that um, uh, those texts were received by, say, Plato and Aristotle, uh, for both of whom there was a distinct contrast between the uh, with, between drama and epic, um, with very different evaluations. Uh, Plato coming down more on the side of of epic. Uh, precisely because there is a, a sort of figure of the poet who can be seen to be um, uh, uh, the performer who, who, uh, whose uh, activity of fiction making is obvious as against drama, which pretends to be real life and the very, and more or less the reverse position in Aristotle. And it seems to me that uh, particularly in the 50, in the 16th century, um, people would have been extremely aware of those two positions um, and of the, of the question of how to uh, uh, transform, uh, uh, how to make, how to move back and forth between those genres. So for example, Tasso, um, who wants to articulate an, a, uh, a, a, uh, <clears throat> an Aristotelian theory of, of epic has the problem that Aristotle really doesn't talk enough about epic. So he takes the categories from drama and moves them into. Uh, in any case, I, I could go on from here, but I, I, these are just a set of considerations that, that these wonderful uh, uh, talks and responses have, uh, have generated for me. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Albert. I'm sure that uh, everybody here would have things to say about these three points. So I will just um, leave it to our um, speakers. Um, who wants to um, get Sarah? I can start us off. I have a feeling that I may have caricatured my own views uh, into suggesting that I do share this kind of older version uh, of a perfect uh, public private dichotomy between epic and other genres uh, that Nora, I think, very rightly rejects. And I think you're absolutely right, Albert, to point to the Odyssey as already a text that is really trying to break down this dichotomy, as in fact the Iliad is trying to do, right, to question the unquestioning elevation of the public, of the communal, above the personal, uh, above the private. I mean, I think epic is a genre that has always worried about this possibility um, that the communal might become the overwhelming, overarching, all devouring beast that subsumes all private duty. And I don't think it helps uh, that the paradigmatic epic in the Renaissance became the Aeneid, um, which is, is, is ultimately a lot less not okay with that. I'll put it that way, uh, than Homer is, um, for all that Virgil's further voices, as, as amply shown, um, weigh the cost of this, right? Virgil, I think, is much more willing to say in the end, no, the Odyssey, an attempt to have your cake and eat it too, is, is wrong, um, is morally culpable. Um, I, would, I would add to this that I think the, the Odyssey is very largely about the ways in which personal desires and personal concerns, right? Love of your family, love of your home, just in its most basic senses, um, can reach the level of heroism, right? It is really about expanding uh, the ideas of heroism that are commonly accepted 
in the Iliad. Um, the Odyssey makes the Iliad's kind of marginal doubts and questions and pushes uh, its center. Um, and in doing so, uh, to go back to yes, radically expands the horizon of expectations for what, what counts as an epic value, right? What counts as a communal concern? Uh, what counts as a value that a community can subscribe to and say, this is something that defines us because we share it, because we prioritize it. Um, it's also to, to pick up Nora's uh, comments about gender, which are so important in these questions, right? The Odyssey is the epic above all others that really asks, where is there room to think about women's activity as heroic? Um, where is the room to think about what we mean when we talk about female heroism, right? Given that there is no Greek term for heroine. Um, and to think about how we construct scales of virtue for evaluating that question. Do we assess women on the same continuum as men and decide that at a certain point, once you've reached a certain level, you are a hero, regardless of your genre, of your gender? Uh, do we think about uh, carving out a separate spectrum uh, on which we can assess gender specific virtues? Uh, and say at a certain point of relative excellence, you have qualified to be a female hero, but for being chaste, for being um, a devoted wife, or having uh, virtues that we would never assess men as having in these poems. Um, and in fact, Wendy's, you know, Wendy, your comment about wondering what uh, Princeton undergraduates were meant to make of the mosaics. Um, reminds me of one place where it's Plutarch, uh, very explicitly discusses this question. Um, and it, it gives us sort of two discussions of it across the Moralia. Uh, in one, one place, in the, I think it's in the advice to bride and groom, uh, he says that um, Homer provides us with the ideal uh, example of a good match in uh, Penelope and Odysseus because she was as chaste as he was, um, wise, prudent, you know, so forth, so forth, so forth. Um, Paris and Helen are the, the kind of epitome of the bad match um, because uh, he is rich and she's beautiful. Uh, these are clearly not the reasons you should be choosing uh, a partner. Um, he also has a fantastic comment that I love um, that I, I'm paraphrasing in um, Mul Ryan and Brown's translation of it, of the version of it that appears in Conte's Mythologiae. So this is a comment that has actually a very wide reception in the Renaissance and a very large afterlife. Um, but Plutarch says, um, Circe turned most men into pigs because there's no point in getting familiar with insane or stupid people. But with Odysseus, who was wise and prudent, uh, she was his constant companion. And I mean, the idea of dating advice from Circe, I just find so fabulous. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I wonder to what extent <laughs> these mosaics are meant to, to do the work that these essays are thinking about so much, right? What are the different ways in which the later receptions of these ideas, the ways in which we then think about them as embodied in the people that we meet in our own lives? Um, are being transmitted to us, reworked, explored through so many different layers of reception, through so many different passages into different media, ultimately to go out to force us to think in our own lives, um, personally, but also uh, potentially with much larger, larger consequences for what kinds of societies we want to build, for what kinds of values we instill in our children, for what kinds of uh, opportunities educational and otherwise we offer uh, to young women as well as to young men to come and sit under these mosaics and be inspired to think about these questions. Um, you know, when I say that epic is a, a genre with public and national and communal uh, implications, I see it very much in the scale of, of weaving back and forth between um, what are these big questions and how do how is each person asked in an audience and a readership um, to internalize them, think with them, interpret them for themselves, think about themselves in relation to these larger uh, social constructs, social ideas, and then go out and knock down the walls when they don't think they're helpful. <laughs> so I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, this was great as well. Um, if, if 
someone wants to comment further on these points, I mean, we do have a few minutes left. Unfortunately, our time is uh, um, running. Um, we do have a question in in the in the Q and A, which I think, I mean, I would be inclined to redirect to Wendy. Um, and the question um, is about bodies and voices, specifically about. Um, vocal registers as markers of identity. The question is, um, how does the exclusion or inclusion of women, female bodies from the performance of both epic and opera compare to women's, or women's, I should say, social um, exclusion um, in the society, which is sort of hosting those, those genres? Yeah, um, well, it's an interesting question, and you know, Emily's example also brought to bear on on what what it means when you switch registers and how how that changes things, right? So, I think I would simply say that that we um, the the voices that we hear. You know, we're, we're accustomed to in the 20th, 19th and 20th centuries to equating gender and pitch level as sort of being the same thing. And um, except in a lot of exceptions, like certain kinds of pop music and certain kinds of, you know, um, you know, certain kinds of, of playful, you know, drag shows and various things where we're playing intentionally with this. But there's that notion that if it's high, it's female, if it's low, it's male, and that heroism is a certain way. And of course, earlier on, you know, as I think um, many of us know that, you know, in the 17th century, of course, you have that sense that the high voice could be a castrato, could be a woman, um, and 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 that sense of one-to-one -one identity of gender and subjectivity and sound, it just it, it just isn't there. And I think part of what we do when we think about embodying these roles is allowing for the possibility that there can be this kind of flux. So I think I think in some ways the short answer is that you know women physically being on the stage has to have changed things in ways that we can only that we can only begin to guess about, right? So oh well the castrati were the rock stars and blah blah women. I mean you know one of the things I tend I I've been working on in another project and that I tend to to really believe in is that the way when women were on the stage early on in the 17th century, their speaking voice and their singing voice were similar to one another. And this would have they wouldn't have sung like opera singers today. And we have to know that as well. So the woman who saying Penelope was probably not singing in a deep mezzo soprano voice going de misera you know, whatever I mean that was not what she would have done that would not have been the vocal thing so that's the other act of imagination that we need to do um something I'm working on a bit now and some work now but is to think what not only what do women's and men's voices sound like but what would have those voices sounded like compared to the trained operatic voices today and I think it would have been much closer to speaking and much lighter and much more like the way I sound now only singing, right? So I think there's that aspect of it too. Um, and um, every era is going to play with that sense of what voice is according to its standards. So now we're in a moment where thinking across gender and voice is much more fluid than it was even 15 years ago. So my students now, I talk about the Castrata, like they, they totally, they want to right away talk about whether, how do we think of the Castrato in a transgender, in a world with transgender. They, they're right there thinking about voice in ways that my students 10 years ago did not think about it. Um, and, and just one final point, a quick point I'll make is just it sort of picks up on what Albert was asking and the point, Sarah, that you made so beautifully is this notion that that what those personal relationships are like, that's achieved in some way by the solo voice. So once you have a woman and a man singing that, and once you end Monteverdi's Ritorno with Penelope and Ulisse singing together in a duet, as a man and as a woman, and, and, and with him in the lower register, that is this moment of great personal intimacy. Like all that stuff has transpired, as you're saying. And then it comes down to two people singing together in a way that they've never been heard before. And that's that personal intimacy that breaks down the public. But I think maybe voice is the path to that, and gender is a big part of that story. Yeah. Uh -oh. 
<laughs> right. Uh, I think we will need to uh, plan for another meeting to go ahead with uh, these conversations because these are all excellent uh, points and extremely um, interesting ones. Um, I mean, I see that uh, we are sort of at the end of our um, time slot. And uh, um, if we don't have other questions or some final comments um, from our speakers, um, I think I will just um, get to uh, close our a meeting today um, and I would like to thank uh, once again our presenters um, Emily Pillinger, Sarah van der Laan and the editors of Performing Omer, Wendy Heller and Leonora Stoppino. By the way we have added on the website of Casa Italiana where the event is advertised a link to the Routledge web page of the book where you can find all the details and I found out this morning that the paperback is coming out soon in March apparently. Uh, which is great news because, of course, it means that um, the book will be even more easily accessible and uh, cheaper. So that, that's fantastic. Um, and, uh, you know, I would like just to uh, go very briefly through the names of the contributors because I think they all did a marvelous job. But we have uh, Deborah Steiner, George Harn, uh, Eleonora Stopino, Ellen Rosand, um, Hendrik Schulze, Michaela Baranello, Andrew Eggert, Joanne Cavallo, Robert Ketterer, Michele Cabrini. Edith Hall and uh, Pietro Frassica. So congratulations to uh, both the editors and to the um, authors. Uh, thanks very much to our audience. It was fantastic to see so many people joining us from um, all sorts of different places. Um, the second event of uh, Viva Voce will be on March 25th. Um, this will be a talk by Emily Wilburn from the Graduate Center at CUNY on early modern voice and the representation of racial difference with a response by Jenny Cole from the University of Cape Town. So stay tuned and I hope to see you there, but also to see you soon in person at some point. Thanks very much, everybody. <laughs>